Sure. I'm Sabrina. I am the Director of Research at Taylor Service Center. We provide phages for compassionate use patient cases. And Justin. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Justin Clark. I am the lead data scientist for Taylor. I work with Sabrina here in Houston. And Jean-Paul. Hello, I'm Jean-Paul Pirnet. I'm doing phage therapy research at the Queen Astrid Military Hospital in Brussels, Belgium. And um, I talk a lot, so you might already know me. My name is Ariana. I defended my... Uh, my dissertation in the Center for Fate Technology, and right now I am in Olympia organizing Evergreen currently. <laughs> so I hope to see a lot of you at Evergreen too. And today we have Rodrigo Ibarra. I'm not allowing you to introduce yourselves because although I know that I can't pronounce your name correctly, this is something that <laughs> um, I, I'd rather you introduce your self and what you've done, which is super cool, by the way. Thank you. Uh, yeah, my name is Rodrigo, and I'm a postdoc in the University of Copenhagen. Um, I'm working basically in trying to repurpose page components and also components from page satellites to deliver, you know, therapeutics. But at the same time, in the lab that I'm working in, uh, they look a lot of uh, on the microbiome. They do a lot of studies in the microbiome. So we're starting to go in deep of what's the re the relevance of having peakies and, you know, the ecological impact that they have. Because a lot of the, the times we spoke about, you know, the phages and the virums, but also these are very present uh, in some bacterial species. Most of them are actually very linked in, uh, on pathogens. So now I have the opportunity to work with very big data sets and with amazing people that are very good bioinformaticians, very good people at like using facts. So it is pretty exciting. And previously I was working with Jose Penales, who was in Glasgow University, but now he's uh, in Imperial College in London. Fancy schmancy people in the yeah. faith world. Um. So for those coming in, welcome to Phage Friday. This is something that we do every Friday, uh, except with a few exceptions, but every Friday at 1 Central, 1 p.m. Central. And please translate that to your time zones because I kind of suck at that. But um, <laughs> uh, meanwhile, um, should we start then? Sure. Sabrina? Yes, we're, we're recording. Yay, awesomeness. So yeah, for those who, who um, we should have put it in the title, but whatever. Um, we have fake satellites being recorded so that people that cannot join the conversation can actually listen afterwards. So um, let's start talking about what a fake satellite is. What is it? So these are typically mobile genetic elements, uh, and they parasitize um, bacterial phages. Uh, originally, when they were discovered, uh, it was in the Staphylococcus aureus uh, species, and they were designated a different thing. Um, obviously, there's more. Uh, for example, the P4, if it's a satellite, but they hijack components of the phages to mobilize into other cells. In some occasions, they also interfere, so they can serve as defense uh, for the bacterial cell. Uh, their families are very, very, very interesting. They're, they're very diverse. We believe that they change because they need to adapt in their bacterial host. So there are, there are mechanisms that probably it's more advantageous to work for example, completely or abolish the bacterial phage that they hijack. Or in other ways, it's just better to keep also the phage so they can also evolve with it and then pass into other uh, cells, for example. We like to call them hyperparasites. 
because that's the- exactly what that was my question. Why not call them face parasites instead of face satellites? Um, I think it's because it's the degree of parasitism that they show. For example, there's some evidence that there's, for example, in, in the some of the phage uh, satellites, we have the pickies, and the pickies are phage inducible chromosomal islands. So these typically are linked on, you know, to be to sense a helper phage, and then once the helper phage has infected or started its replication, you know, being induced by S response, for example, um, they will normally hijack. Uh, the components and in this case there are others that actually can induce their page like the people for example so it's i guess it's because of different degrees of parasitism and i think now we're coming to a point that we're learning more about them we're learning more about for example p4 now uh, eduardo rocha has come up with very nice results that they actually show there's a complete family of P4 like elements that harbor defense systems. And it's super interesting because we, you know, for example, in the PKs, in the gram negative ones, we don't really see that. And actually in some of the gram negative PKs, we see that there might be PKs that have a completely functional, you know, capsid or, or way to mobilize but they might be lacking something or they need like the adequate phage to really parasitize. So it, it is tricky, but I guess that's why we call them satellites because they, they're they just like orbiting there in the cell and then when they can, they just jump into the phage and basically hijack. Oh, that's super, super, super interesting. So let's go to the picky. What is a picky? So a picky is a phage invisible chromosome island, and these were first described as SAPIs, which is the Staphylococcus aureus pathogenicity islands. Um, originally, they were thought to be cryptic phages, you know, phages that they lost the ability to mobilize, they lose the... But it was uh, Richard Novick who saw that they were actually mobilizing to- uh, toxin genes, uh, anti, uh, sorry, virulence factors. So, and and the mobilization was linked always to the presence of bacteriophages. And from there, hosts start to see that these elements were actually sort of the structure was conserved in other gram positive, and found uh, very similar elements of. Sapis in other gram positive uh, species, uh, like for example, Enterococcus fecalis. And from there, they start to wonder well, could we see these ones in gram negatives? And that's uh, now at least we know that E. coli has some, um, Pastora uh, multocida. And there are, I have to say that there's also other species that we have not been able to find. Uh, Pickies, for example, and I think it's just a difference of what defense systems the host uses against phages and also the ways they can mobilize. So, for example, in staph, which staph aureus would normally be found in skin, for example, probably it needs to share more things like outside. It's not very planktonic, it's more like a biotin. So it's, it changes the dynamics of how you perform horizontal gene transfer compared to, for example, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which could normally found, you know, in more sort of uh, in inner parts of the body, and then um, it can perform better conjugation, for example. Uh, this is very interesting. So for those of us who have never looked at how this would look in a genome. How do you identify these satellites, generalizable or picky, and how do you differentiate them from other mobile elements in a bacterial genome? Yeah. So typically, and actually something that we are doing is we were trying to develop this 
picky typer, or at least, yeah, picky typer. And the way we're looking at it is uh, regions that are very similar to the functional, or, or at least the modules that a temperate plate would have. So you have your lysogeny part, which could be, you know, for example, the integrase, and then the regulators for like the C1 crow like genes. And then afterwards, you will have all the genes re uh, regulating the <coughs> replication and excision. And after that, it will come all the parts for packaging. And in that part, normally you will have, a, let's say, a smaller identity of what you would normally see in a, in a phage. So when you look at them in the genome, it looks like a phage, but then it could be a third of the phage, for example. And that's why they thought these are defective. But actually, when you look into more detail, the integrases, for example, they're not they're not uh, they're not similar to the ones of the bacteria phages. Uh, for example, most of the pickies actually have different attachment sites in the chromosome than the ones that have the phages have. <coughs> Okay, so, so wait, so that, that that means that actually you're trying to identify pinkies and differentiate them from prophages, actually, and not necessarily from exactly. global genetic elements. Yeah. And so uh, how do you do that? And the, the way you, you dictate if it's actually a pinky is normally seeing if there's interference with phages. So... Uh, there's also pathogenicity islands that are very similar in the structure, but they are not as mobilizable as pinkies, for example. And normally, whenever you try to mobilize the, the pinky, or at least infect with a, a panel of phages, for example, you would see interference of the phage replication, of the phage reproduction. And that's essentially the pinky being activated, being induced by the, by the phage. Um, are pickies generalizable? Like, if I were to infect a given bacterial strain with multiple phages, would they have the same effect on all of the phages? Is this something? Is this something that is more of a generalizable effect, or is it like a one-to-one -one match with a phage that I, a, a particular phage infecting this whatever strain I'm looking at? Yeah, it's not one-to-one -one because there's phages that. Can, for example, a, a sapi, uh, the ones in staph aureus, the pickies in staph aureus, you could induce a sapi with different phages. But normally, for example, they will all be uh, at lateral. If we speak about sapi, sapi 1, most of them would be a uh, CIFO, uh, a so a very, very similar type, but still different. So they're not as constrained as, for example, with some bacterial phages. Um, and for example, you can have another SAPI that is not induced by the most common ones, but then maybe more for uh, cause ones or a different uh, staph aureus phage that is not really related to the ones that we commonly use in the, in the lab. Um, for the gram negatives, gram negatives, for example, the the picky that was well described, uh, the strain where you can find it has also other four prophages. But the four prophages are actually not very good at inducing it. And then when Alfred was doing experiments with this, he noticed that the PQ was very good at hijacking the lambda and the uh, phi 80 uh, bacteriophage, which is also close related lambdoid phage. So it is, we can say it's a bit specific, but you have more options. You, and th this is something that we speak on the, on the review about it, that you can have different phages, but Actually, you can have something that induces, but then that page could have a different. So, the range of infection that you could have because of the receptors that you can use to infect. Okay, so wrapping this up is yes, it's it's more general, gen generalizable, but not to all pages. Yes, to some pages. Yeah. And it actually either enhances the phage or prevents phage from infecting 
so mother paid from infecting the bacterial strain, which is super cool, by the way. Sabrina, you had a question. Yeah, I was wondering, have have there been any, any occasions where a phage became a, a peaky? So these elements integrated into the phage genome? Yeah, so that's, a, that's part of the sort of evolution that, that we, we discuss a little bit. So some people think that these are de novo uh, because the, the, the key parts of the phage, they don't have homology to bacteria phages. They could be functionally wise and similar, but they're very distinct and uh, they're normally just from uh, what we will call genomic islands. The other sort of idea that uh, some of the experts, you know, we, we just discussed that with, with some like Jose, King Seed, and they think that maybe there was a genomic island that just acquired genes from phages and other uh, mobile genetic elements to be able to hijack. And uh, this is why you see changes uh, from species to species. However, you can also see, as you you see mosaicism with uh, with bacteriophages that you know they evolve by recombining with each other. We also see ha this happening with sapis, and I wouldn't be surprised if suddenly a sapi recombines something with a phage to be able to mobilize it if the right conditions are are there. And spoiler alert, this is coming out very soon. We actually know that there's peakies that hijack other peakies. So this is another degree of parasitism. And this is actually, we saw it in Nasapi, and then this Sapi was very similar to Sapi 1. And actually, it hijacks Sapi 1. So Sapi 1 can indu be induced by the page, and then this other Sapi is induced, and then it basically takes all of it from the page leaving SAPI-1 interfere. Not completely abolished, but the, the, the transfer rate very, it decreases quite significantly. So a satellite from a satellite, or a parasite yes. of a parasite. Yes, it gets very <laughs> this is a, convoluted. A, a parasite <laughs> of a parasite of a parasite, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The parasite of a parasite of a parasite. Yeah, we already consider PPs as as parasites of the parasite, because phages are parasite of the cell, you can consider that. And then there's another parasite of the parasite of the parasite. So, yeah. Oh, that's super cool. So, how do you classify, or how do we classify satellites, these phage satellites, other than the satellite of the satellite of the parasite of the parasite of the parasite? <laughs> so, is, is there any way of classification? That's the first part of the question. And the second part of the question is, does classification relate to um, them being active against a specific uh, phase, say, or type of phase, like virulent versus um, versus lytic? Is that something that happens uh, or that actually occurs? Yeah, there, there's, there are satellites that can, uh, can hijack lytic phases. Uh, for example, there's some sapis that also in uh, hijack lytic phages. Um, however, I think it, it got to the point that, you know, it came from a very specific family trying to broad and trying to understand if there was similar elements to it in other species. And then the classification sort of started expanding. Um, for example, the cause phases, uh, the cause peakies in in the gram positives work very differently from the cause peakies in the gram negative. For example, the cause peakies in gram negative are much more efficient because they don't rely on a terminate for themselves or a, they completely hijack the terminates of the page and just basically redirects it. And it's incredible uh, this what they do here, because we've never seen that. And compared to, for example, the gram positive, you will normally need another two genes to actually perform the interference and also the packaging. And commonly, we would say to classify a satellite, you will have to consider that has different attachment sites than the ones that prophages occupy. Normally, the induction of them is related to a is independent to an SOS response, 
So the regulators, like the ones that look like C1 and CRO, would be dependent on the phage, not on the SOL response. And the absence of lytic genes, they are not able to to basically lyse the cells on the, on, the, on the cells. They rely on the part of the phage that carries that. Bob! Hola, Bob, you came up. Let's see. Am I unmuted? Yes. I have a, you mentioned that uh, there's been a sappy that's been described to parasitize a lytic staph phage. Could you speak to what family of staph phage you found this in? Um, I remember speaking with Nuria about this, and I believe it's a bit, I mean, the, the, there hasn't been like a proper study, like in, in the papers. It's just an observation that people has had in the lab, and I think the one who reported it was Novik, and it was a lytic version of the T80. Uh, so that would be a, a lytic mutant of the ordinarily temperate okay. family. Yeah. Ah, okay. Now, yeah, where if, for example, a, a staph phage, K-like phage, or one of the, the tiny families of lytic phages has ever been described to be parasitized by a sapia, that would be incredibly relevant news for therapy. Yeah. Which, and I don't know if we've tried that, actually. Um, it would think what type of uh, family, like, is it, like, close to C4, is it a medium? So the, the, the major family of phage used for therapy right now is this the K-like phage, the, the K-virus, which is a 127 KB myovirus. Yeah, that's a bit too long. I don't know. I, I would hope so, at least. Yeah. It would be interesting. I, that's, a, that's another thing that um, we are observing and trying to actually perform some experiments in it, is how in certain scenarios, you know, you need to consider these other events. So how uh, lytic phages, or not even, not even lytic phages, how, for example, transduction uh, gets affected by the presence of these elements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where well, the, these phages do have transposases. Oh, and so probably do on, on some level perform horizontal gene transfer. Oh, at least to, to some degree. But if they were to mobilize sapies, that would be a, a whole different question for safety. Correct. Yeah. That would be very interesting to explore, actually. I, I, I know Rich Novik, at least in the past, has been quite critical of the idea of phage therapy generally as a result of his experience with sapies. So, yeah. You know, what what are your thoughts? Yeah, the opinion it goes the same. Uh, also, when I was speaking with Jose, uh, he also said, you know, you are going to try to apply some sort of therapy, but you also have the sapis, and you never know. And it's actually how I got involved in the story of the sapi sapi, like these um, parasite that parasitizes another sapi. Because in, in, in my work, at least how I came to work with Jose, it was the idea of can we repurpose a sapi and put a CRISPR-Cas system and then use this as a uh, antimicrobial uh, approach and we see very good effects with you, you know sometimes you can actually infect other strains so if you want to create a broader approach against pathogenic bacteria it is it is good but you see interference and you see for example in, there's there's a very nice study and it shows that some staff uh, species they, you cannot really infect them with with either sapis, and it's because the structure of the tocoic wall acid changes. Mm -hmm. So you still have this constraint, and so in that aspect, the, the, the same sort of idea that Novik has that yes, the sapis are there, therefore maybe phage therapy is not the best application. And I would say I am also in, in that idea. However, I don't think that one bullet will save us because we've seen it and, and there was a very nice story uh, of the use of antibi antibiotics and phages together.
and you keep much better results. And I think it's not going to be a matter of can we use stage to treat just you know this whole infection. I think I think it has to be a degree of combi uh, combinatorial therapy. But at least with staph HK like page, they they have quite broad host ranges given the the quite low diversity of Staphylococcus aureus. Oh, and I, potentially they could. But there is this concern of, uh, well, what if they were to mobilize SAPIs? Uh, when, when I've been asked by regulators whether that concerns me, I've been able to tell them that SAPIs, at least thus far, have only been found to uh, be mobilized by serotype A, B, and F, uh, those, those temperate staph phages that are at 46 to 49 KB. Uh, yeah. But if, if that answer were to ever change, that, that would be a big concern. I guess they could be, I mean, as I said, these things evolve, and if they find a way to parasitize these pages, I wouldn't be surprised if suddenly we find one. Um, but I guess it's just a matter of um, actually addressing that or just simply expect that that won't happen. Uh, I guess if the moment someone does find it to happen, if if, it, if indeed it is possible, Rich Novak will be able to tell us all that he did, in fact, tell us all. <laughs> because a very, a very interesting, uh, which are another family, which is the the picky like elements, which we always say it's, it, it, we hope they would be part of the pickies. And these are normally, uh, Kim Seed Lab does amazing research from them and for example they identify that a phage to counter the, the picky like element uh, basically hijacked CRISPR Cas system and integrated it so it can target the, the plea and then basically compete against the plea. So this is very unique and I wonder in other species could you also see these arm rays like things be you know, ad adapt modules from other elements and then just to basically fight that page or repurpose that page or vice versa. The page actually fight against the the hijacker. Well, well just thinking about this from a therapy and safety point of view, now uh, in therapy, really the one thing we have no control over is the bug that's infecting the patient. Uh, that's That's the... The one element we can't really alter. Oh, and so yeah, we wouldn't really be able to know whether our CRISPR system would be functional against the peaky within that bug, oh, unless that oh, functional evidence was, was was generated, which wouldn't really be achievable on a clinical scale. Yeah. Yeah. I so you said the. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead, please. I, I spoke with someone in uh, Sniffer Bio, which is a company here in Copenhagen, and they told me that one of the biggest concerns using, for example, similar approaches like the PKs and capsid-like deliveries is how much you can control of the horizontal gene transfer, because they see that sometimes it mispackages things that you don't like. So. Uh, the regulations, at least in Europe, are a bit more tight in that aspect. And uh, they say that they hope in the future they could open more the opportunity to explore this. But this is the main uh, constraint, at least around here, uh, yeah. at least these sort of applications. In the US, it's a judgment call that the FDA makes. Here in Europe, it's there's legislation that defines what regulators are able to do, which is unfortunate. Yeah. I mean, the, it, it, this is a matter of informed decisions and clinician decisions, whether these things can actually, I mean, what is the impact of the therapeutic and the phage removing at least enough bacteria to help the patient, but what is the effect on the rest of the bacteria around it? It, it, this is this is like the whole story that that makes it very very interesting. I wanted you to touch base on something that you recently published in your review on how 
um, PTs are used and satellites in general could be used in biotech applications. So there were some very interesting ideas in this paper and I found them, uh, well, could you discuss some of them at least? Sure, sure. So one of the ideas, and this has been always, we, we try to promote the idea to the synthetic biology um, community. And I, I really try to do some of that stuff, but uh, my hands are not as good as some of the big groups in synthetic biology. And is the repurpose of these switches that the, the SAPIs or, or the PIKIs use for sensing the phages. Because sometimes uh, they are, you know, the C1 crow from Lambda is very well used for different applications, for diagnostics, for you know, detecting several levels of, you know, uh, pathogen in the gut. It's being used for production of certain metabolites. So, in this, in this sense, it's still that that switch is sensible to SOS response. So, we part of the what we are discussing in there is could you implement these non SOS inducible uh, switches to monitor the same sort of process and actually it could be a very neat way to monitor for example uh, invasion of pages and even integration you could just employ these switches and then because they sense the pages or you can actually evolve them by using for example phage assisted uh, continuous uh, evolution you could do very neat things and for example, some of these uh, switches, they're able to sense more than one protein that comes from the page. And this is why the, the, the PIKIs are able to hijack more than one page. This is, so I, I thought about this in another way, and it's basically the fact that um, there are places where you actually want to inhibit phage infection on your strain. Say yes. production of yogurt or in general yogurt fermentation. You really want to maintain your bacterial culture and avoid that any phase, at any cost that phages are going to mess up that bacterial culture. And so maybe is 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 there something like to think about? Maybe okay, if I put one of these these elements or these satellites into the strains that I'm using. Maybe I can get them to inhibit phage reproduction enough that I can still maintain my culture even though I lose a couple of cells. Is that something that, that makes sense? Yeah, we discuss it also in the part of the defense mechanisms. And it's, the, it's an idea uh, I, I talked to, to it with Rafa. Rafa is an expert in CRISPR gas systems and anti CRISPRs. And basically, he was firing up oh, how can you repurpose the parasites and actually make them a sort of host defensive strategy and you know it was it was super nice writing the the, the review and suddenly you know for example kim seed she came up with very nice papers on the fleas and then also eduardo rocha came up with the p4 like elements that harvest these uh, clusters of anti-phage defense systems so you could totally potentially reuse them and for example let's say if you make a Picky or like a defense system based on pickies to interfere the for example shiga toxin carrier uh, carrier phages or for example if you want uh, to stop infection or as you said stop being infected by phages you could maybe target very specific phages for example ones that in staphylococcus that carry the staphylokinase and essentially it's like a Let's say minimize the disruption of your micro microbes that you have. It can be in a industrial setting, or it could be also in a microbiota setting, uh, because obviously, uh, for example, the Shiga toxin uh, normally gets expressed when the phage is induced. So in that sense, you sort of abolish it and don't interfere with that induction of the phage. This has the potential of being a very targeted way to choose which phage can and cannot infect a specific strain which has very very cool industrial slash 
agro food applications and maybe um, if we find a way to repurpose them, some therapeutic applications as well. Joseph, you wanted to come and ask questions. Hi, Joseph. Joseph, are you there? You're not, you're muted. So if you're listening to me, you. There was a question, an anonymous question. Oh, I'll get it next. <laughs> okay. Hey, Joseph. I'm okay. How about you guys? Pretty good. Awesome. Uh, my question to Rodrigo. Do you really have, uh, do you really have tangible evidence showing that actually lactic phages can uh, evolve in this distribution of cells? Uh, yeah, so there's there's some evidence that, for example, the, the picky like elements, they hijack uh, lytic phages. I don't think they, they've seen doing the hijacking in temperate phages from Vibrio, so... Okay. And can they actually uh, facilitate the distribution in the environment? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Can the lytic phages actually... Dis uh, the distribution of, of, of uh, cell, cell life phages in the environment. Yeah, so that's the thing we uh, I was uh, discussing uh, just before, and it seems you know if the potential if there's a potential of, of the PQ or the or the phage satellite to hijack the lithium phage, it will most likely be mobilized and distributed in the environment by it. So one of the mm. aspects of the PQs, and this is now in debate, is mm. that. Most of these guys, the the main uh, purpose for the for the bacterial cell is that they will mobilize virulent factors. They will mm -hmm. give uh, bacteria advantageous genes for them to be pathogenic. But actually, mm -hmm. we found some PKs that they don't carry any of these genes. And now we are investigating. Okay, maybe this is actually a sort of defense system that increases in a way different aspects of the phage biology. So I, I think it can happen. And how similar are they to the phosphorus? Sorry? How similar are they to the phosphorus phages? How similar are the phosphorus phages? How similar are they to the phosphorus phages? Joseph, we might be hearing you. It's, it's, it's a bit choppy, so you say, how similar okay. are they to, and then there's blah, 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 and we can't hear you correctly. I'm so sorry. Or maybe it's just me. Okay. How similar are they to this first spreading phages? The, the mutant phages, like the one that, that were discovered by the Eric and the groups? Uh, I mean, they are, they are, in a way, structurally, the modules is very similar to a tempered phage. Mm -hmm. But the, the genes that they have, they're very different in sequence-wise. Functional-wise, they are very, you know, they, 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 they perform the same, like, for example, recombinases, integrases, but the identities are actually different. And this is why, for example, they integrate in different uh, locations in the genome than they're actually the pages. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. If anybody has questions, uh, please raise your hand and come up and ask. You're more than welcome to. And Serena has a bunch of, or a couple of, of anonymous questions. If you want to send anonymous questions, you can just press a little airplane or arrow on the side of your screen and message either Serena, Jean Paul, or me, and we'll just ask the questions for you. Okay. Um, how do satellites impact phage production practically? And how do we get rid of them? <laughs> well, the first question, it depends if the phage satellite can sense the phage. So if, we, if you're infecting your strain with one of the phages that can hijack, um, it can affect at several uh, levels. So commonly, the main level that they will do is like interfere with the packaging. So, for example, some phage satellites, or at least most of them we know, they will reshape the capsids. So they will limit the, they will make a smaller capsid, and then that capsid will be able to introduce all the phage DNA. So 
So that would be, uh, let's say, maybe a tenfold. It can be more. But then you also have other mechanisms that interfere with, for example, the actual packaging. Like they they will just completely interfere the terminases from the page and then just repurpose their, their and exploit more their terminases. In others, they will really affect the late uh, genes so they won't let the phage excise, for example. And in some situations, uh, you can actually not have the PT per se being induced, but actually some of the mechanisms it can I still hijack. So you will have a transfer, let's say, equivalent to a generalized transduction. But most of the time, if you have the peak induced and then all its machinery will be working, it's a very high transfer, very, very high. And sometimes if you compare it to lysogenization of pages, it actually surpasses like 100 fold sometimes. Uh, you get very high titers of if it's a very compatible page. And how to get rid of them? Um, I mean, you could mutate the regions that they're located in. You could use technologies like the Cascade, the Cast3, for example, um, that chops a big part of the, of the genome. Um, but besides that, just, you know, maybe mutagenize your page and avoid it to, to induce the PT. And this actually is a way that we sort of study the repressors. It's normally you evolve the phage to counter effect the PT. And then once we have this mutant, we will normally compare it sequence wise, and then we will see the mutations and then suspect okay if this protein has changed the sequence then probably this is the gene that activates it and now it has completely gone silent and then the piggy doesn't get activated at least that's for the piggies um, I'm, I'm not entirely sure for example how this approach will work in the piggy like elements i guess i had a quick question um so you said yeah. that the capsids would be smaller uh, does that mean you could identify them, like by imaging? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, that's one of the first things that Novik did. They did like a electron microscopy, and they could see smaller capsids, and in functional. Because sometimes you know you have like defective capsids. These ones were just uh, a third of the size, and it, it goes, uh, you know, based in in hand in hand with. The aspect that the genome is a third of the size normally of what the bacteria page would be. Um, this is also a strategy that the police in Vibrio cholera uh, also used. The P4, like also reshaped capsids. However, there's also some PKs, for example, that they don't really reshape. But for example, this is one that is very particular because it carries a biofilm producing gene and it's massive. So it needs the big capsids to actually go and be transferred. So they are that, but most of them, I would say it's a commonality that we see at, let's say, 80%. That's really fascinating. Um, is the mechanism by which these satellites reshape page capsids? And furthermore, uh, uh, um, uh, when, when the capsid becomes smaller, you say that it correlates to the genome size of the satellite element are the are the uh, is this like an actual transmissible form where um, the picky will have a extracellular form that will be transferred to another bacteria or is it a dead end where um, the smaller capsids are being made but they're not actually used for anything? no no these capsids are very well functioning uh, some of the mechanisms are known uh, for example, for the SAPIs, is very well described. For the the ones, the satellites in Vibrio cholera, they've now come up with a very nice evidence of how it does it. The P4 has also been very well studied. Um, so yeah, it's it's the the small capsules are functional, and in some situations, I can tell you in my personal experience. For example, SAPI-1 makes a lot of small capsids, while um, 
Sapi Bob one. Uh, depending on which page combination, you can get more bigger cap sets. And uh, this is just basically how the dynamics go with the compatibility of, of the whole cap set. Um, so is it, is very, it DNA driven or is it, uh, are there picky expressed proteins that are causing no, it's, it's different? Right. right. So are the, are the proteins themselves uh, are they attacking the phage tape measure proteins? Are they changing the capsid bending? Are they changing the capsid DNA interaction to cause nucleation in a different shape? Or, or can you give me the short version of what's the mechanism by which the capsid shape is meant? I think the, the, the genes that they carry, at least the ones I know from the, the SAPIs, they would change the nucleation. So they will, uh, I mean, the genes, they, they will morphogenize the, the, the caps in a smaller way. And I think that's mainly the, the, the one. It's, I'm not expert in the, in the structural part of these guys. Uh, however, if you go and search for uh, Docklands papers, he's very specific, he has very focused on, on the structural part of the SAPIs, for example, and some of the other piggies. And uh, in those papers, you could actually see more specifically how they reshape it. So the T number changes. Um, I don't That's really interesting. Oh, yes. Thank you very much for that answer. You're welcome, JT. Yeah. Um, again, this is, this is something that I find super fascinating. Please, people, if you have more questions, please come up and ask questions because you already know that I talk a lot. Um, are there any more questions right now from people up here before somebody else is brave enough and come up? We don't bite. <laughs> Even though there's a dog barking behind me, but there, we don't bite. Uh, Jean-Paul, did you have any questions? Am I... Um, no, not really. Oh, okay. So I, because I thought I saw your mic flash. Sorry. It might have been my application. Um, okay, so I do have more questions, and it doesn't, well, a couple of questions, and it's more towards, more geared towards, um, the, bi the biotech applications and your combination of SAPDs or satellites with CRISPR cas So, yeah. um, you mentioned there's some results, they, and that some results that will allow for uh, phase slash also bacterial genome modification. You want to talk about this a little bit because I, I think it should be very interesting for people to know as well. Um, let me. So there's like there, there's been ways that we've tried to modify uh, phages, for example, and uh, one of the things that we talk about is how can you use, for example, a PG to evolve receptors, for example. So you can easily use the PIGI to then uh, harvest or mutate receptors so then your phage is able to infect it without actually just using the phage to evolve it. The PIGI will replicate more and the, and the parasitic um, nature will do these mutations. Um, regarding the CRISPR-Cas, the way we use them is not for mutating or attacking the phages per se. We've used them for attacking pathogenic bacteria. So it's like targeting a housekeeping gene, for example, so you can get rid of all the staph warriors, or targeting, for example, an antibiotic resistant gene, which we did in, in, in our Nature Comp paper. Uh, we target, for example, uh, carbacillin resistance genes, and these ones were normally carried in, in plasmids. So Kiga had the idea of can we use the Cas13, which is an RNA-based uh, Cas system, and essentially doesn't matter if the gene will be in the genome or in a plasmid, the, the bug would be killed. Because this causes, a, it detects a transcript and then causes this collateral that degrades of the, all the RNA from the bacteria. So this has been the way we've used, at least now, and also Novik, he, he and his postdocs have used the SAPIs for 
treating staph aureus infections and also listeria. But so far, we haven't come up with at least a publication, and I don't think no one has actually done this in the lab, of a way of you uh, basically putting a CRISPR-Cas system in a SAPI so it can fight phages. And the reason why we haven't done really that is because the PIC is already good at manipulating the, the phages. Unless, for example, maybe you want to force this against the lytic phage that uh, Joseph, Joseph or Justin was commenting. So, okay. In terms of therapeutics, because, you know, I'm a fan of, of phage therapy, but in terms of therapeutics and what Bob was discussing is in terms of safety and do how do how do we account for picky, um, do we know the distribution of pickies in nature? Are there metagenomic studies where you can find signatures That's of pickies? We're... <laughs> That's what we're doing just now. And oh. so far, yeah, exactly. So that's why it's very interesting to see this because um, in a way this will show us, okay, these guys are actually very occurrent and then probably for the use of some pages it won't be the best strategy. However, one of the reasons why we thought did you want to use these, um, these satellites as a, as a therapeutic is because if sometimes you want to manipulate a page, you have very little space. If you still want to keep the page, you know, so you, the way you manipulate a page, you know, you have maybe one KB of manipulation in the genome. When you use the, the for example, the PIKIs, you can actually have 30 KB more to use. So you have a space to adapt different CRISPR cas for example, you can put reporters. So that was one advantage. And the other advantage that we saw is they are very good at integrating. So in a way, if the system gets integrated, the bug will carry it. And then in a, in a way, you can maybe sensitize cells against certain, for example, plasmids against certain uh, mobile genetic elements that would carry toxins that you don't want them to acquire. So biotechnologically, it works super well, even though, or it has a lot of potential, even though we don't know how well distributed these are in the environment and yes. specifically in clinical environments, even less. Yes. Exactly. So uh, the worry exists, Bob. The worries exist. <laughs> <laughs> no, they exist. And for example, one thing that was investigated and discovered from uh, studying PIKIs, some phages are good. They can infect more species of what we uh, initially thought. So staph phages can actually infect listeria because we found that sapis can mobilize into listeria. Now, the way we normally measure phage infection or phage replication is looking at the phage plaques. But this is something that we also mentioned in the review is that we have to sort of go away from that dogma because the, re the, the aspect of a phage reproducing and generating, you know, lysing a cell and generating a phage plaque doesn't mean that the phage actually was able to infect the cell or the bacteria. And in this sense, for example, these phages in listeria are not able to replicate or not able to reproduce and generate and lyse the listeria cells, but actually mobile genetic elements coming from staph aureus can go and be transferred to these species. And this is called uh, silent transfer. So the news is even worse. We have to re fix this. <laughs> There's a, another question from the audience. Um, are there any studies in vivo showing the impact of the satellites? Like in a therapeutic way? I'm not quite sure, but I think that's what this person meant. The, the, the paper from Novik uh, tested this in uh, my spot. And, and other collaborators from Posey and I, they've done the same in other models. So 
it is it is it is proven it has a very good um, um bro like uh how you call it um it has good effect uh the fact that you can produce high titers of them and not ha and actually abolish the mobilization of the page is one of the aspects that was also very attractive but yet in in other countries for example it, it's the concern is okay these are these guys actually ca can carry you know toxin genes and then how is the dynamic when they counter another one of them what sort of things can you actually develop there so um as you said metagenome studies of these elements are necessary to really understand and see what we can actually perform with them biotechnologically people we have so much to learn still every time we look at this big <laughs> post interaction something new comes up crispers and anti crispers and now face satellites and this makes so this is cool but it also i, I understand <laughs> where the apprehension comes from in, in actually using this as therapeutics and without knowing the mechanisms behind it it's it's it, there's so much to do still i yeah. found it find super cool sabrina you're gonna say something else no no just saying yeah really interesting i i'm wondering if 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 there is a high throughput way of testing uh bacterial strains specifically from patients because as bob mentioned there's no way for for any of us to control which strains of patient strain slash strains uh which that the patient uh is infected with but i'm wondering if there is a high throughput way of identifying potential sapi in bacterial strains infecting people well, part of the metagenome study that we're doing is going to, we hope it will give us an idea of that. Because, for example, some of the pathogenic strains uh, in Staph aureus, we've seen that they carry one or more SAPIs and multiple pages. But then in others, for example, the Newman strain, the Newman strain carries four uh, pro pages and no PKs. So it, it, I guess it really depends on them. We hope to classify these families and, and see okay this is prevalent and these sort of isolates from this area in the human and also another thing that we need to start and this is what we're also doing is okay this can mobilize into other close related staphylococcus species how much these how, how much of for example sapi one can we found in other staph species so sapi one for example carries a Toxi shock syndrome toxin. So, yeah, I mean, the Newman strain is infected with K, but I don't know how mobile then it'll make it'll make so K infection will make the sappy go. I think this is very interesting. I think there's a lot more to figure out, especially in in the therapeutic space. But there's also a gigantic potential in the biotech space, which sounds very yeah. cool. And I encourage people, and I, I really encourage people to either email me, but you know, I'm I'm starting. I'm basically a postdoc, and I'm starting with this. Uh, but email, for example, Jose Benades, uh, Kinsey, like these guys are the, the, you know, they know what they're doing, and they know these elements more than that, what I do. Like they, they've seen them evolve, they've seen and characterized everything. So I really encourage people to approach to them. They're very, very nice. They're always open to collaborate and helping people. And it's the same with me. Like we are happy to, to investigate ideas, go into crazy and explore new stuff. And especially for my, my point, I really, want to go into the sort of therapeutic scenarios. So for me, it would be very interesting to sort of start collaborating more with people that, for example, like, like you guys, that you guys actually search for pages that you can actually go and put in the clinic or into a patient. It's a, again, more potential for collaboration. I really like this. This is awesome to have, it was awesome to have you in this space so that you can teach 
talks a lot more about uh, phage satellites. As, as you see, this is a cool topic and it has a huge potential impact in in a lot of areas of phage research, which I really find very interesting. Um, I think the hour is up. Uh, Sabrina? Oh no, just getting ready to say bye. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Rodrigo, for coming over and taking the time to talk to us about phage satellites. Thank um, you for the invitation. No, this is awesome. It, please come back more often. We have we need more news, especially with your metastomic study. That sounds super cool. Yeah, we we really um, I sometimes really want to join one of some of the Friday the phage chats. However, sometimes you guys are organizing them and it could be like three AM at mine, which I don't find, but sometimes there are things going on that you're like, no, I need to really sleep. Uh, <laughs> but for example, Fridays like this, I really, I really enjoy it. I think I'm, I'm, I'm really gonna uh, uh, join more of the, of the chat because I've seen some of the topics and some of the people that uh, you guys have brought into the chat. Uh, I'm fan of them, and obviously, I would like to even, uh, you know, have conversation with them. So it is, it is a great space to you know, get to know the people and also communicate. And as I said, if someone here in the chat wants to reach out and talk more about them, uh, more welcome to. That's the whole point of Fate Fridays, Yay. for people, for us to get together, despite the fact that we're all over the world and find out what we're doing more often. <laughs> yeah. Okay, people, what's the hour's up. Thank what's next so Friday? Much. Yes, Sabrina. What's next Friday? Oh, next Friday is actually not necessarily Evergreen. Friday. Friday. We're Evergreen. going to be in Evergreen. Yay. So yeah, next week, we'll hope to see you all at Evergreen. Um, Evergreen is going on as a hybrid meeting. For those who are not registered yet, you still have time to register. Uh, it's evergreen.face.directory. Um, please register. I hope to see you all there. Um, we're going to have Face Clubhouse at Evergreen since Sabrina, Jean Paul, and I are going to be in the same space. So, this is going to be like talking shop about what happened at Evergreen since we don't all get together, all get to get together. Um, this might be like a cool let's grab a beer and talk about what was talked about in the day, what we found cool, and et cetera, et cetera, happening. So, uh, please. Pay to, like just be just search in our social media um we might have one tuesday another one thursday uh but we'll kind of pass that out as evergreen um uh, schedule happens but there's a lot of stuff planned the schedule is also up so you can see who's speaking uh we hope to see you all there next week and on Space Club and Clubhouse as well to talk shop about Evergreen. Yay! Yay, can't wait. I know. <laughs> We've been working hard to get this going, so I hope you all get to enjoy a little bit and talk to other people too. I hope you I hope you sites. get to enjoy it, Adriana. Since you've been so yeah. so busy. So well, much work, Adriana. No. I the reason this is happening. <laughs> Not true. Face Directory has a huge part in this. Thank you, thank you, thank you all. Okay, guys, see you next week. Uh, please look in our social media. We'll keep you updated on how Face Club Evergreen Face Friday or Face Evergreen will occur on Clubhouse next week, and then uh, we'll let you know how the next the next session occurs. Meanwhile. Uh, have an awesome weekend, have a happy Faith Friday, and we will see you all not next week some at some point, maybe Tuesday, Thursday, and then um, for sure the week after Evergreen. Bye. Have a great weekend. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you, brother.